Hello, hello. Welcome back. Let's jump directly into AI and the power duo from NEBSEC. And you probably all know NEBSEC. It's a flexible end-to-end -end design systems platform. And first off, we have Chris Stroll, and he's the co-founder and the big boss of NEBSEC. And when, he, when he's not running the company, he's guiding folks down rivers. And I think it kind of makes sense, right? Because when you're working with products and design systems, it's just like guiding, uh, it's, it's just like river guiding, full of unexpected twists and turns. And then there's Ivan, he's the other half of the founding, founding team, and he's acting like the CTO of Knebzek. And he knows coding like the back of his hand, but there's another kicker because he also gets people thanks to his degree in psychology. And I really hope that we're not uh, seeing digital avatars, but you're the real people here. Um, and welcome, both of you. How are you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having us. This is an awesome opportunity. Really appreciate y'all. Yeah, a fantastic it. day. So yeah. excited to be sharing with everybody. Thanks for having us. Yeah, lovely to be here, and um, I hope you're excited as we are. Um, but let me just ask you the first question. Does your product name comes from the German word, der Knapsack? I mean, Evan, do you want to take this one? It's kind of a fun story. Uh, yeah. Uh, so when we were picking the name, we had it narrowed down to a few choices, and we started searching, you know, for knapsack, and we came across... Uh, this old math problem called the knapsack problem. And mm -hmm. the whole idea is it's like given a constrained space, a backpack or a knapsack, and you have mm -hmm. a limitation of weight and you have a bunch of valuable items, each with weight and a different amount of value, how can you bring the most amount of value within the weight constraint? And that really struck with us because we kind of think about that, like with design systems and, you know, you can only load so many components on a page before it makes the page slow and people don't like it. And so how can a design system provide the most amount of valuable value in the tightest package that kind of resonated with us and it made us uh, laugh a little bit. Um, you know, the person who came up, the mathematician who came up with that is, uh, his name was Toby. And so that's the name of our design system is Toby. Oh, nice, nice connection. Um, so before you, we start with the AI, I think it's the hot topic right now. Um, I would like to hear your view um, just in a few short sentences. How has your view evolved uh, over time and especially in the, few, in the last few months because a lot of stuff is happening with AI automation and probably you have a lot of ideas for your platform. Uh, how has our view changed? Um, so, I mean, I, I remember the early days of Knapsack when it was still just like a, a nascent, um, you know, whiteboard diagram. And Evan and I were drawing, you know, boxes and lines and arrows and dashes and stuff like that. Uh, and um, uh, we always had this, this like kind of like cloud bubble around a part of our app that was like AI slash ML goes here. And um you know, we were also, we were funded by, by Gradient, which is Google's machine learning fund. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, one of the big, like, like question marks was always like, all right, like, like, what does that actually look like? And then last year when we saw the, the, the splash that LLMs made, um, for the first time, we're like, oh, okay. We, we understand like, what we put in that, like sort of black box now. And we're going to dive into that as, as a part of the talk, because there's so much, um, that, that we've both done and want to do that's really exciting in this space. Yeah, when we were talking about it back then, we kind of always knew what we wanted to use it for, but we just didn't think AI is ready. And then pretty much like everybody, you know, uh, late last year when GPT um, came out, we basically looked up and went, oh, we think AI is ready now, I guess. So, <laughs> so we were excited to be able to finally put it to use for what we had been thinking about and planning about all those years ago. Mm -hmm. And now you're spending all nights just hacking. <laughs> well, um, some of us are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if you're ready, we can jump directly into your presentation and uh, we will have time for Q&A in the end. Sounds good. 
All right. Can you all see that okay? Yes. I always struggle with presenter view, so I'm going to leave it looking like this. Um, so anyway, I, like we've already had the the little introduction. Um, you know, together, Evan and I co-founded Knapsack. Um, as a, a brief story, we were an agency that was was building custom design systems for a couple of years before we really landed on the product side of things. And there were kind of two two thematics about why we built Knapsack, the product that are um, still prevalent now in the the talk about AI. And that is that design systems are innately cross-functional. It's not about just design. It's not about just engineering. It's not about just content. It's about all of those things all in one place. And then as a second aspect to it is that our reliance on structured data is what makes these systems really, really valuable. And so there's a, a kind of a, a theme with that. Um, Evan, you want to say anything about, about yourself? Um, yeah, I mean, I just basically like I kind of come from the front lines. I mean, you know, I got my start in my career as a front end developer and basically experienced firsthand the pain of translating designs to code and always was working on a better way. And so, um, you know, it's exciting for me to be kind of building the tool that I wish I had all those years ago. Awesome. So just kind of a, a quick look at what we're going to talk about. Um, we're going to look at a, a brief history of this whole concept. Um, we're going to talk about what did we want to do with AI and, and what's sort of dreamland for us and then what's the reality of, of the practical implementation. And then we're going to really try to relate that deeply to design systems. So how does this actually impact our work? Um, do you want me to hit the slideshow button? I'm seeing that in the chat. All right, I'll do it. Can you guys still see that now? Everything's great. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Um, and then a lot of this is about also changing the way we work. And so how do we actually like structure the way we work around this um, slightly differently? So uh, uh, I like to start with like, where were you on the, the great day in history, November 30th, 2022? Um, I remember seeing the first tweets and chats and text messages about this. Um, it was really crazy because a bunch of my non-techie friends and non-designer friends were sending me text messages about AI. And it kind of freaked me out a little bit. I was like, you know, okay, so so what is this all about? Um, and lots of questions come to mind, like, like you know, are, are we experiencing sentience? Has something passed the Turing test? Um, you know, is this the rise of Skynet and, and all of the freaky things associated with uh, uh, that reality? Um, and then of course, you know, I had my, my crypto friends being like, is there an NFT of this I can buy? Um, but my first person that texted me was my dear friend, Adam. Now, Adam and I play tabletop role-playing games together. Like we play stuff like D&D like &D and Blades in the Dark and, and things like that. And so it was really funny to get a text from, from Adam about this because he's, he's an electrician. He has nothing to do with tech at all. And, uh, you know, this is, this is what he sent me. Um, <laughs> he said, hey, here's a picture of me. I fed this picture into to AI and here's what I got out. <laughs> And I had to laugh and I was like, this is it? This is the AI revolution? Um, I was, I was, you know, saying like, all right, so what does this do for us beyond the creation of really neat D&D avatars for, for our tabletop role-playing games? Um, there's a lot of potential in AI right now. And a lot of that potential is wrapped up in, in these dreamland ideas of, of where we're all headed. And that's really cool. We should dream. We should get excited about this technology. We should be really stoked. But I also think that there's an inherent idea that this is either going to like, um, you know, make all our jobs obsolete or end the world or do something so remarkable that humans just aren't going to have to work anymore. And all of that sort of lands in this realm of inflated expectations. And this happens with the adoption of any new technology where people see it for the first time, they get really, really excited about it. And we inflate our expectations really, really high on what this can possibly do without really thinking about the reality of, of how it actually works inside of our daily workflows and, and our applications. And so I think that we're standing at either at the height or near the height of inflated expectations for AI. And so I do want to basically put out there that like there is not going to be an app, at least in my opinion, in the near future that is going to be able to like build your design system for you based on a prompt. There's going to be a lot of different systems that are going to interact with one another. They're going to make all our lives and our jobs easier. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So constraints really, really help out design systems. In fact, you know, that is kind of the big idea with them. 
you know, what we're doing is uh, basically saying, hey, users, don't pick from 16.7 million available hex codes, pick from these, you know, crafted 32 different colors. Um, don't pick from, you know, any like size of like, you know, for uh, like a grid gap or anything like that, pick from like our um, spacing tokens. So by being able to like limit the choices when you come to like design tokens, you create consistency. Consistency creates harmony. It creates basic predictability, trust, it's efficiency, keeps people on brand. And, you know, it's not just with like design tokens and limiting the choices there, but also, you know, don't pick from every combination of HTML elements, pick from our components. Also components have like props and variations that basically like help you narrow it down. Um, you know, make sure like the button can't be basically any size from one to a hundred. It's basically small, medium or large. So those constraints really are what is, you know, important with a design system. And it helps basically streamline decision-making. It helps basically creating like harmony with like the end user experience. It's a crucial piece here. I feel like this is, you know, not something I have to sell you all on. Um, so I think it's, you know, we're all kind of sold on this piece and this idea here um, about providing the guardrails there. So I think also AI loves constraints. And so, um, you know, AI has a classic like garbage in garbage out problem. And I'd argue a lot of things do, but if, if you basically are saying that, um, you know, hey, AI, build a nice landing page. You know, it is going to have those same problems that we kind of just talked about. Um, there might be like, all right, I got 16 million colors and all these possible ways to be able to put like HTML together. And yeah, that one landing page might look okay, but it would be off brand. And so, you know, basically with all of the, the large language models out there, you can't really just like expect to pick one of those up and have it know about how you want things to be able to done. So you, to be to have them be done, and so AI thrives a lot more on structured data and being able to basically say like, "Hey, let's go ahead and organize it." Like these are our like you know color choices to be able to pick from. These are like the components in basically like the you know the artist's toolbox, and so um, you know the. The point here that is that like these two things kind of like work pretty well together because really like uh, without them, um, you know, you're going to be having some problems when you basically ask AI for some help. Um, you might be trying to be able to like get some assistance here on, you know, improving the color contrast on um, some stuff that you're working on. And so by basically constraining the both you know AI and with your design system, you're going to be able to get a higher quality output. So this gets into like garbage in, garbage out one more time. Is if you basically have like high quality in, you're going to get high quality out. And you know a des design system is a basically it's like system systematized decisions that can scale that represent design that are the design that represents your brand. And so being able to take all of those small decisions. Um, you know, the amount of uh, time and thought that goes into picking a, you know, a company brand's like primary color is huge. And so being able to take all of those little decisions and being able to like feed that in greatly increases the quality of the output, both when you're just using a design system, but also if you're using AI with a design system. And so my, my kind of point here is that, um, you know, Design systems love constraints, AI love constraints. So therefore AI is gonna love design systems. I think that these things will work very, very well together. And you know, as far as anybody here being like, okay, how can I get my design system ready for AI? I think you kind of already have. You've already constrained a bunch of the choices. You've already made a lot of like structured decisions that basically are gonna be able to get picked up by this well. You know, there's a lot left to be figured out how it gets picked up, but you're already organizing it. You're already getting your house in order. And I think that it's something that you should kind of rest well on there. And so, you know, keep doing all of the great practices that you already know about design system. Keep, you know, 
fighting the fight of basically not adding like you know uh like snowflake uh one-off colors and all of those things because those that are just going to feed well into how we want to have things set up so what are we really trying to do here right we're all trying to change the way that we build our products and we're trying to basically take it so that the things that we're doing in the land of design intent actually match the things that we want to create for for the products themselves um this is my my favorite sort of uh uh you know analogy metaphor image that that relates to this right you can make the most beautiful thing in the world but then ultimately like does that show up in production and that's the biggest question um and and you know i saw the shots fired at engineering there's some shots fired at design in a minute so we'll get to that here in a second um but the idea being can AI help us actually change this? What's the point of using AI? And I want to kind of dive into to this specifically here in a second. So there's two pathways that we want to think about for like, what is the context that our AI operates in? And one of them is the context of design and design tools. So like, should I take Figma and make it react is the really like simple way of, of making this, this uh, uh, you know, drawing this conclusion. The other side of it is like, what if we make it so that our React code can actually just be manipulated by people that don't understand how code works? And so those are the two kind of contexts that are competing in the world of, of AI right now about, you know, do we take the, the image of a thing or the intent of a thing and then try to make the code out of it? Or do we actually take that code and then try to make it so that people can more easily manipulate it? There's probably a bit of both here, but there's a couple of clear advantages and disadvantages to this. On the good side of, of you know, design to code, um, it follows existing workflows. People understand this. Right now, almost every organization um, has some sort of like waterfall-ish or agile-ish process that has a design to code process. And so that is a common handoff that exists in almost every product team in the entire world is I go and I make some designs and then I take those designs and I turn them into something that is actually consumed by users in a browser or in a native app. Um, the problem with that is that it's not really based in structured data. There is not a lot of data structure to the idea of like, I clicked on a coordinate plane and I have a mouse click at one coordinate point and a mouse click end at another coordinate point. Um, that box is fundamentally unstructured. It's all code, yes, at some level, but deriving actually structure and information from that data is difficult. And I think that design tools are really racing hard to try to figure out how they wrap a little bit more structure around the things they do in design. But even more fundamental than that is users don't consume Figma files. Users consume HTML, CSS, or Swift code, or, or Kotlin, or whatever it is that is ultimately on the other side of things. You can make the most beautiful Figma file in the world, and you can put it up on Dribbble, and you can do all those wonderful things, but a user is likely to never actually see it. And so when we think about like what is the destination medium, the destination medium is code. And so there will always be a translation process between design intent in a design tool and the actual implementation in code. And that puts designers in a really difficult position because that means that all of the design decisions that go into your app are not happening in your design tool. There are things about performance. There are things about states. There are things about even st simpler stuff like animation that are only happening at that code level. And designers are shut out of that decision-making process. Um, so if you think about it from the other perspective, one of the really hard parts about saying like, okay, well, like let's let's take uh, and and use less design tools. That's first of all like heresy in the land of of design, right? Uh, uh, like make me work with code, maybe work with Git. Um, there's some allergy to that, I think, in in the design process. But this is also about like how can we take the design processes that we're doing and bring them into code without actually having to learn all the ins and outs of how like branching and merging works or all the ins and outs about how, um, you know, the React state um, or X state or TypeScript work. Um, the ability to take code and actually make it easier for design to work with, and not just designers, but all types of non-coders and put product people and, and content people in here as well, that does one fundamental thing really, really well. And that is all of a sudden, everybody is working in the same place with the same tools with the same common understanding of what users actually are seeing. Um, now, this is also really hard because there's not a lot of precedence for this, right? And so this is organization change, culture change, changes in workflow, and all of those things create really human problems to actually witnessing this reality. 
so when you think about that, like I wanted to, to kind of illustrate how this is thought about in Knapsack. Um, this is Evan's realm, so jump in. Sure. Um, so let's see, I want to talk a little bit about like kind of Knapsack and what it does and how it works. And then we want to talk a little bit about like, you know, how it uses structured data. And of course, we'll basically bring it kind of back around to like how we want to be able to use AI. And so, you know, we have kind of some, you know, fundamental principles is basically like, yes, well, I think that like the source of truth is in code. I think it should actually be thought of more like the source of truth is what users experience. And users don't look at Figma files. They look at something that is created from code. You know, users don't look at code. They look at something that's created from code. And I think that that's important to be able to remember because it's about what users experience. And so we want to be able to be as close to like that source of truth as possible. So the way that Knapsack works, actually, wait a second. We want to be as close to um, the source of truth as possible. But the problem is, is that that's traditionally like the realm of like just people who know how to code engineers. And then what that does is create silos. I think that's one of the problems with like a lot of design system tooling is that everyone has their own source of truth. You know, there could be basically like a zero height, like doc site. There could be like a, you know, engineering storybook. And then of course, like, you know, a PM somewhere has got like a magical Excel spreadsheet with everything in it. And the problem is, is that they are, they have different sources of truth. And so that's going to lead to like challenge because there's, you know, different, uh, di different visions of like what things are in reality. And so what we want to be able to do is we believe that the source of truth is in code. And so what Knapsack does is it stores all of its content in a code repo as a bunch of JSON and YAML files right next to all of the coded components. And we have a, a UI, it's an entire bit like to be able to manipulate that. So like anybody who's working in Knapsack doesn't need to need like use code or like know of it. They can be able to make edits. And the thing is, is they're aligned with how things ship to users, which is people make branches and then they propose changes and then those things publish on out. And so um, that's basically how like Knapsack works. So a designer could be able to come in, hit edit, and then it, um, did my video freeze? It looked like it did. Nope, you're there. Yep. Okay, sorry, we started the video. So a uh, designer can be able to come in, hit edit, and then be able to make changes to some of the stuff. We'll get into the stuff in just a second. And that lives right in code. Um, so wanted to talk about that a little bit. And so let's talk about how Knapsack, like, you know, has some of its like organized structured data. So there are design tokens stored in like the W3C token spec um, and basically an entire admin UI to be able to edit that. Um, that changes out to like creates like CSS and SAS and, set, and heads on out. There are like components being rendered in the medium that they're destined for and there's basically edit forms to be able to play around with them. And so what, and documentation. Um, and so what, what I want to get into here is that basically like we also believe that when it comes to using a GUI to make web pages is that it, we don't want to recreate the Dreamweaver problem. We think that the building blocks should be expertly crafted. We believe that the buttons, the cards, the heroes, the grids require professional designers and developers to closely collaborate to make excellent, flexible building blocks. Now, once you have those building blocks, putting them together is pretty easy. You can be able to do that inside like a GUI, like no problem, because you basically have constraints. You know that like the button has basically a spot for, I'm sorry, you know that the card has a spot for a button. You know that the button can be small, medium, or large. And with, once you know those constraints, it's easy to be able to not know code and build with them. And so basically that is like the user creator prototypes in here. And so what we do is basically feed that structured data into AI. And so knowing the different colors that are available, knowing the different components that are available and seeing how they get put together, AI can kind of help you out by kind of being like a buddy in the chair next to you saying, hey, you might've like missed this token. You've got basically a darker token you missed. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. But this idea here is around structured data being manipulated in like a repo 
without having to know code is kind of our angle and what we think like is missing. And it's basically about bringing multiple disciplines together because you shouldn't have to like no code to be able to work with it. It's lowering those bar barriers and democratizing access to it because the more people you can get in on how your, you, use, your user interfaces look and work and feel, the better it's going to get. You wanna get a lot of different opinions there and you don't want opinions just from people who like know how to code. And that's kind of our whole idea and our whole angle. So the other part about this is it's about more than just one AI system. Like there was only one box that said AI in that prior diagram, but the reality is, is there's several different AI systems that are all interacting with one another. And this is how we think about it in terms of, of our view on, on the world of AI and design systems. And by the way, all of these images that you see here were generated based on AI prompts. Uh, we basically fed parts of the deck into, into um, the GenCraft generator and created these images as a result. And I totally love them. Um, so first you have the librarian. This is about the discovery of insights. Uh, it's a very good listener. Uh, it usually takes the form of a chat bot or something like that. Um, there's the assistant. Uh, the assistant is all about suggestion interfaces vis-a-vis um, -vis things like, uh, you know, autocomplete in Gmail or um, smart suggestions that that happen sort of as you work. A lot of different transparent UIs that provide you really clear point in time value. And then there's the creator, which is, you know, the person in a chair that is is helping you actually build the thing, very similar to, to Copilot. Um, and the idea of the creator is, is that they're they're helping you uh, they're inspiring you. And they're also making sure that you are thinking about things that may not necessarily be on the surface. And then there's the manager, which is sort of the invisible hand behind it all that is uh, guiding towards optimization. So what is the, the optimal outcome? So if we think about these things in sort of a, a deep context, we're all building novel length things and calling them design systems. There's hundreds, if not thousands of pages of content if you would print most people's design system. And being able to understand exactly how I gather and discover information in that is a really hard problem. Um, because it's not like uh, uh, the people that are supporting the design system can be like, you know, turn to page 232 or just go to this URL to answer your question. We need to have a better way of discovering and, and understanding how to actually use and, and surface the things that we need inside of, of our systems. And AI is really, really good at this. Um, I actually use this all the time in tabletop role playing. Uh, if anybody has ever played D&D, &D, there's like 12 rule, box, uh, 12 rule books. They're all really arcane. Um, there's hundreds, if not thousands of different rules across them. The ability to feed all of that data into an AI and then ask it simple questions about what is my armor class? What is my chance to hit? How do I roll these dice? What do I do in this scenario? And have it actually return answers to you is so much more valuable than an index in the back of a book. Um, and that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to be able to have people ask any question of their design system and have it actually give them an answer and to a link where they can find maybe more information. And the best part about these is we're sort of experiencing chatbots right now, which are pretty one-sided, where everybody's just asking questions and getting some context. Um, but the reality is, is pretty soon the chat box or the chatbots are actually going to be able to ask us questions that, have, that help them provide more clarifying information. And uh, we're actually working on this right now in, in our UI, which is super exciting. Um, the other fun thing about this is just kind of an aside. Uh, um, uh, we're doing this with the Design System Podcast, where we're actually feeding all the podcast content into uh, an LLM. And then we're having it respond with my own voice, which is like really unnerving as the host of a podcast to have like something respond to you in a voice that is yours, but you didn't actually say those words. Um, Kind of moving on, the assistant is another one uh, that's really interesting. Um, so this is all about, like I said, uh, uh, you know, uh, co-pilot. Like this is this is something that auto completes your things. This is something that makes it so that uh, uh, you are being able to move more quickly through simple tasks. And so this is really about common workflows. So I need a new spacing token that's extra large, so it suggests extra extra large. Um, I know that uh, oftentimes primary buttons have an icon attached to them. So let me just add an icon prop to, to this primary button component. Um, and so there's lots of things that assistants do that are all about like autocomplete functionality or things that extend the basic work that you're doing already. Um, 
another XKCD comic because I honestly love Randall Monroe and I can't get enough of, of his books. Um, it's my my favorite thing. Um, I love this. And that the idea of like, hey, you know, if you have a bunch of predictive models that are sort of creating the context for your autocomplete, those predicted models have this ability to leak in really interesting ways. Now, this is obviously an example of something that maybe you wouldn't want, but there's lots of examples of things you maybe would want. So this is a good... Um, lesson in thinking about the content that goes into our design systems, having things like voice and tone guidelines, having things like do's and don'ts, having things like accessibility information, all of that provides context for a model that will assist you in the creation of things. Next is the creator, possibly everyone's favorite one. Um, this is amazing. And this is where probably the most whiz bang side of the opportunities are, right? The idea of being able to have something that sits next to you and creates content for you, real true generative AI is really powerful. And this is what everybody has gotten so excited about. Having um, you know, a chat GPT-like interface to write docs about your design system, um, having something be able to describe how your properties work, or even create tests for you inside of your design system. What we're really excited about in this too is the ability to actually create prototypes or, or create full page experiences based on, on components. Um, it's not a gigantic leap to say, hey, write me a description of a button uh, based on my, my React code and based on my design file and have it actually create something in your own voice and your own tone. It's not a giant leap to go from that to saying like, let me create a full page experience using components from my component library. Um, and you can have things that model design conversations here, uh, that model a design process. Like, let me start with a header. Let me start with a uh, hero. Let's add a three column layout. Let's add uh, uh, pricing cards for, for um, cheap, baseline, and expensive. And then let's add a footer. That sort of mimics the way that we think about the creation of design. Um, and being able to do that with a, a prompt tool or some sort of interface that allows us to build that experience, that's a really exciting future. And then last, which is like kind of my ironically favorite one, is the idea of the manager. So you're probably not ever going to see the manager because the manager functions as an agent inside of your system. And that agent inside of your system is driving towards optimization. And this involves a concept called reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is all about gathering um, uh, results from, from your, your AI and then measuring the value or impact of those results. And so for most web pages, especially things like e-commerce, that's conversion targets. So if I know my targets or what I'm trying to accomplish with my design, and I have a bunch of structured data that I can vary in interesting ways to achieve those results, why wouldn't I have an AI tool that's sitting there marrying those design decisions with the actual desired user behavior and making optimization suggestions or automatically optimizing things themselves? And so we can sort of stop the idea of like, is it rounded corners or square corners that converts better? Because we can actually make a data-driven decision about that in a way that is pretty automated based on AI. So if you think about the sort of, you know, scale of this, right? There's the idea of like, how much structured data do you have and how complex is that task? And so in the, the like highly complex, highly structured data side of things, there's that manager box. In the still structured, but more unstructured data, but complex is that, that creator box. These are the ones that are really hard. Those really complex problems in AI are the things that are going to be the most difficult to actually create inside of our apps. But all the stuff on the left-hand side of this that are simpler tasks that use either structured or unstructured data, this is stuff that is very, very present and very, very doable right now. And so at Knapsack, we, we pretty much are, are in the, the late stages of the stuff on the left, and we're in the early stages of the stuff on the right. And so we do want to do all of it because it is about an interaction of, of multiple systems, but being able to say like there is one AI solution is just fundamentally incorrect. There's lots of different problems with lots of amounts of varying complexity, and it's going to require lots of different AI systems all working together to really get the true value out of this. So let's talk about what that looks like actually in our app right now. Uh, Evan, you want to dive in? Absolutely. So, you know, kind of like it says here, chatbots, suggestions, and generation. And so being able to, you know, get, uh, get questions answered back and forth that summarize up huge amounts of information. 
um, you know, being able to kind of find out like, hey, what could be like the voice and tone that I should be using here? Or can does this um, statement here, does that align with like our docs on statement and uh, on statement and tone, you know, or voice and tone, sorry. And um, being just kind of there, that's like the librarian piece there. Um, and also being, having a lot of like the right context as far as like, hey, what is like the wealth of like all knowledge around design systems in general being there to kind of like help back you. Um, and then the kind of the other part there is basically being able to, um, you know, see what you're working on and suggest what could be added. Um, you know, uh, co uh, GitHub Copilot does like a really good job there when you're kind of already starting to work on something and you pause and it's almost kind of like a coworker kept going and you just, you know, hit tab to be able to accept it. And so being able to see your work that's already there and say, hey, you might be missing this piece here. Um, and so then, of course, being able to just like create like, you know, like brand new, like kind of raw content. Um, like you could basically say like, hey, uh, you know, make a page that uh, pitches people on why design systems are important. You know, like every design system like uh, site needs one, you know, about like, well, why do we even exist in general? So let's go ahead and not like repeat ourselves. Let's go ahead and stand on the shoulders of giants. So let's talk a little bit about um, some of the uh, possible possibilities of like what we're talking about we'd be doing in Knapsack. And so being able to be like, hey, I'm working on design tokens right now. And, you know, I've got my primary and secondary color. and I don't know if anybody can can see here is what's missing. Well, probably the primary color needs a light variant because the secondary color's got one. Likewise, the secondary one also like needs a base color. And so usually you have all of these colors with all of those variations, right? You got like the base, lightest, lighter, dark, darker, darkest, et cetera, right? And basically by the time you're like, you've done the primary color, you've done the secondary color, you're off to the tertiary color. I, like, I think AI's got you. I mean, I think by the time you just type tertiary, um, it's gonna say like, hey, you want those like five shades. Um, and so I think that could be happening with a lot of the other colors there. And likewise, if you're over on like a spacing scale, um, being able to, you know, implement like a Fibonacci or basically like any of the other like, you know, vertical rhythm scales that have like a lot of kind of like known structure behind them. You know, it's all like kind of powered by math and everything. And I think that anyone who's used like a type scale or color scales, they, they usually need some adjustment. So I think that AI in general is like a great first draft for things. It's like, hey, go ahead and flesh this out and then let me tweak the rest because I basically have like that human eye that actually, you know, makes it so it feels right. Even if basically like that Fibonacci might be like, technically and mathematically correct. Sometimes you basically need to have like a human go, all right, thanks for getting the first 90% here. Let me go ahead and like make my last little part because a lot of this stuff is just like not repeating ourselves, staying on the shoulders of giants. So another idea here is basically like, you know, um, if you're gonna be doing, um, you know, adding button variations. And so, uh, you know, I mean, if you've got like extra small, small, medium, large, you're probably missing extra large. And then a lot of that stuff also when combined with like, hey, the, the button is primary, secondary, tertiary, and with an icon, you know, it takes a long time to make those sticker sheets to show like, hey, here's every variation. And again, once you like know that there is, this is the type of props this thing takes, I mean, it's, it's easy for a machine to be able to kind of figure that stuff out. And so that, that can basically make sure like, one, it's saving a lot of time on work, but also two, making sure that like, you know, that weird combination of extra small with an icon might have an icon that's just way too big. And so you can see it earlier before your users see it and you can iterate on it and make it better. So there's an exciting future where decisions about the effectiveness are all about behavior, right? It's all about the idea of how can we iterate around designs at the speed of feedback? And this is where that manager agent comes into play. You can think about it like this, right? If you're looking at, at a page, and this is just like something basic built in, in Tailwind, I think, um, you have the idea of like, what is my conversion goal? So I want to optimize this page for signup conversion and learning engagement. And so if I have those sliders as, as somebody making decisions about what the target or, or purpose of this page is, 
I can basically weight my decision-making process around multiple conversion targets. And then because I have structured data, which, which I can actually have a finite set of things to iterate between and a reinforcement learning agent that is constantly monitoring this page for feedback, you can actually get a lot of automation out of this. And so you can basically say like, hey, if I have one fewer item in my nav, I get a uh, fewer clicks conversion. If I have a media block that's actually video instead of a static image, it gives me more time on page. All these different small measurements of, of design value actually in our products creates a really interesting idea about how do we create experiences that are more valuable, uh, more accessible, and easily personalized to an individual's user experience. So this all means that it changes the way we work. And there's lots of questions about how we actually interface with these things, right? Um, I'm gonna get to that here in just a second. But the biggest thing that we're talking about here is there's less and less separation between design and code. And that doesn't mean that like every designer has to learn React. What that means is that people are going to be working more in a code medium, whatever form that takes. That doesn't necessarily mean that everybody is going to write code, but everybody's going to be able to manipulate code and be able to actually build things with it. And this is about democratization. This is opening the floodgates so that not just one discipline can make change and, and actually build things in the medium that something's destined for. Uh, this also is going to create a, an ability to have standards and tests that are just part of the way we build. If you think about moving everything into a code medium, one of the advantages there is there's already a lot of automation infrastructure built up for things like accessibility or performance. And the ability to have that just running in the background as we create to understand the performance impact or the accessibility impact of the design decisions we're making in real time is a powerful step forward in the quality of the products that we create. And then lastly, there's a bunch of metrics that are going to shift. Um, and I, I really hope that this happens. And so this is maybe like with a little asterisk of, of like, hey, if we live in the Star Trek future instead of the, the Scanner Darkly future, this is probably where this is going to go. Um, but we want to transition metrics about product from production to effectiveness. Right now, there's lots of vanity metrics that exist in, in products that are associated with like lines of code shift or velocity or, or some measure of output that is about volume. And it's going to be interesting to see if AI is able to shift that towards user value. Um, for so long, uh, at least you know, through most of my career, the focus in product has been about how much do you ship and much less about what is the quality or the impact of things you're shipping. Now with AI ability to, AI's ability to get that feedback in real time, I'm hoping that we start to think about our metrics differently. Instead of thinking about how much can we create, it's what's the most effective thing that we can create. So the other part of this to think about is, is that humans are still a part of these processes. And so there's no AI that completely takes the place of, of the work that we're doing today and says, we're going to go and just like, like automate away all our jobs, right? Like that's not the reality. What we're talking about is shifting into an AI augmented future where all of our jobs are, are working hand in hand with AI. And one of the big things to think about with this is does creating a system actually save me time and create value or not? Um, and again, because I can't resist another XKCD comic, um, thinking about the idea of, of the theory is that if I'm able to automate a thing, I'm going to have a bunch of extra time to do all this other stuff that I want to do. But in reality, there's a bunch of unintended consequences about automation. Oftentimes, it's about thinking about the cost of that automation and the cost of actually showing people how to use it. And so um, in the case of Knapsack, and, and this gets kind of to the, the question earlier about how do we actually interact with these, like Knapsack has a UI. And because Knapsack has a UI that is connected to Figma, that's connected to um, GitHub, that has all the things in one place, that is like where our vision of your interaction model with, with AI is going to be. There's going to be a chat bot in our sidebar. There's going to be autocomplete inside of our, our workflow. There's going to be the ability to generate prototypes and designs inside of our own UI. Now, that's not the only place that this is going to take part. Like, I know that Figma is working on a bunch of AI tools. There's a whole plugin ecosystem associated with it. I know that there's already stuff in VS Code and in GitHub that are working on, on things that, that continue to advance this. But the point is, is that there's not just one place. There's this entire system that is going to be pretty ubiquitous. It's going to touch all of the different aspects of our workflow. And it's up to us to kind of decide what's helpful and what's distracting. And funny enough, this was an early argument against design systems. I remember having this conversation three or four years ago about like, are design systems actually valuable 
or is the investment and the time created in the system and the change that needs to happen inside of my organization to see value in the design system actually worth the amount of effort I put into it? And so uh, I think that everybody here probably feels like it was, but that is definitely an important question to be asking ourselves about a lot of this tooling. And then last, does it ship to production? This is a fundamental question that everybody should be asking themselves about the systems that they create. There's lots of things that we do inside of businesses that represent a lot of vanity or a lot of like incremental value, but not actual real value in our products. And this is a big problem in that we create a lot of things that do good jobs at creating reference sites or lighthouses or uh, North Stars, but ultimately don't impact the thing that we ship every single day. It's not to say that those things aren't valuable. It's just not something that is integrated into our every single daily workflow. And um, when you think about the idea of, of what represents real value, it's not just about the ability to ship it to production. It's also the ability to ship it to production at scale. And so scale really matters when we think about systems like this, because we're talking about our ideas about how do we deliver into our products that you know some of you have millions or billions of users that ultimately interact with these things. And so how do I get as far as I possibly can with AI so the amount of human intervention is minimized, but I'm still actually able to create a product that can scale? So that's kind of it. I wanted to make sure that we had plenty of time for questions. So I know there's a Miro board that's out there. Um, I'll go ahead and stop screen, sh screen sharing. Um, thanks all so much for listening to us ramble on about this stuff. Um, we love it. We think lots about it. Excited to, to talk more. Thank you. What can I say? Shut up and take my money if this is happening. <laughs> but um, I have a few questions also from my side. First, I would like to ask you, um, do you see AI as uh, your intern or, or a tool that can actually execute and make final decisions? Because you talked a lot about how we can embed um, different systems, but still there's a lot of decisions that um, should be properly made in, and if there's no translator in between so somebody that understands both code and design side um, how can a tool decide or how can we proper properly set it up because um, i think that fundamentals also matter a lot in design systems yeah I, i'm reluctant to say that there should be like full ai automation of much inside of a system right there still needs to be that human check um, I think that with that that manager agent that's out there, there's maybe some simple decision making that we could have be automated. But I really view AI as much more of a tool than an intern. I think that there is still like the the idea of like how to sit how does someone sit beside you and say, oh yeah, you should remember that your color contrast is wrong, or hey, like maybe if we went this direction with our our landing page, it might be better. But ultimately, it is still about making us faster and better at what we already do. It's not mm -hmm. about like doing something that humans are unable to do in most cases. Yeah, but yeah. Um, so you mentioned that fundament, I mean, when you fit uh, your LLM and you have a lot of structured data, which is of course uh, um, a lot of quality, what will happen with all the companies that don't have all this data? Because if they will not set up foundations right, they will get shitty results. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that like look, AI is really good at finding averages, right? And so the idea of of like, do I just open up a broad scale LLM? I was talking to one of my friends who was one of the creators of the Carbon Design System, and uh, they were talking about the idea of of like, can I have an LLM build something out of carbon, just based on on broad scale like Carbon Design System dot com context? And it didn't go very well. And the reason why it didn't go very well is because that LLM isn't thinking about like, how do I build a website? That LLM is thinking about how do I, I answer this question in the most like, like general way possible given all the data that's available to me. And so there is this idea of how a purpose-built LLM is more practical and powerful than something that is more general. And that ownership of that data suddenly becomes a strategic asset for that company. And I think that that's like a, a really interesting future that we didn't really talk that much about in this is that people's design systems and their their systems and structures of data inside of their company are suddenly going to become a become really really strategically important to the quality of their products and the differentiators between them and everybody else if everybody can do the average at basically no cost at all 
what gives you an advantage in this market? Yeah, I agree. And uh, connected with my question is also how are uh, what kind of implement implementation changes uh, changes challenges are included in this vision in your vision? Um, let's say that today we're working with Figma design system. I mean, we have other tools connected with this. What's the next step to connect a NEBSEC and also all this AI uh, really cool ideas that you shared? <laughs> This one's you, Evan. Yeah, I mean, I think that you want to be able to make sure your design system and your tokens are in code because that's inherently structured. Um, I mean, if, if you have like a poster of what your website should look like, I think that step one is basically getting it into code. And so I think that Figma is amazing. It's awesome at planning, but it's not what users ultimately experience. So therefore it's not the source of truth. So I think that's kind of like the, that first step of, of like preparedness. And like I mentioned earlier is like, think about your constraints. Like, you know, do you have 500 shades of gray? Whittle them down to like 10, you know, things that design systems should be doing anyway. If you have a lot of components that have like competing, like, you know, what they do, if you have a CTA and a button, probably pick one and consolidate around it. Also something you kind of want to be doing with design systems and good design anyway. Yeah, exactly. We need a special uh, body always here beside us that will help us make all these decisions in the start so we don't um, turn in the wrong direction. Um, do you think that design system tools will get more specialized or embedded with AI? Hmm. Can you elaborate a little bit more? Yeah, like, are we talking about interfaces or are we talking about Yeah, about like workflows? all the connections, because if you want to have a quality data, you need a lot of, yeah, connected tools, I guess. Also in your case, because you shared this diagram where you put all the data tokens and everything from the dev site and also from the design site. So I see that as a lot of tools embedded to get um, quality data for your LLM, but in other ways, right now, a lot of tools are specialized. So you get one tool for design tokens, you have another one just for design and exporting stuff, another one for sharing, you know, it's a lot of separate. Yeah, this is a, a fairly classic innovation problem where if you think about like, look, ideally, as the, the the creators of Knapsack, we want to hoover up all that data and use that data as, as um, you know, context for our models. But the reality is, is a lot of this data is siloed. And so how do you create, like, the, the data lake of context that you want across a bunch of tools, all of which will have different data structures, some of which won't have any data structure at all? And so, for example, if you do a bunch of, like, content creation in Notion, right, um, there's some semi-structured data there you could embed that notion stuff inside of knapsack, but we aren't necessarily aware of, of all the things that are there. And so there is um, this sort of siloing problem and there is kind of this intent with knapsack to be the collection point for a lot of this data that ultimately then has AI models running on top of it. Um, and that's what we really want to do. And, and what kind of holds us back from being able to totally realize that is the ability to actually have APIs that connect to all these third-party applications. And so there is a whole integration space that we have. Like for example, um, you know, by the way, wonderful talk on Token Studio, we integrate with that um, to get design token data. And so there's lots of things that we do to kind of try to suck some of that information in and then store it in a data structure that's easy to understand by AI. But there is always going to be third-party data. And there's going to be some of that stuff that like we don't want to do. Like for example, I don't want to create a user analytics app. There's a bunch of those out there. I want to be able to take that data and use that inside of our system to aid in decision making. Um, and so there's always going to be a mix, but the open data is the more important part of it. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, I mean, we 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 one of the uh, initial problems that we um, saw was, was that silos are kind of the problem, and so we don't want to be another one. We'd rather be like a hub, and we'd love to be able to like say, hey, we want to offer as much as possible, but you don't want to be like generalist and like jack of all trades, master of none, as far as like we're concerned with like our application. And so integrating with other uh, services and apps is key because that's also like how the web is built. 
Um, I mean, literally our users content data is stored in their Git repo. I mean, you, it's very difficult to get like more accessible data than that. 